Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the administrative public hearing for the city of Scranton. Since this is an administrative hearing where we can only accept testimony, we cannot respond to any questions concerning challenges at this hearing. I would like to commence this Act 47 public hearing to receive testimony on the rescission of distress status of the city of Scranton under Act 47 as amended, the municipal's, municipality's financial recovery program. At this time, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Our Pledge, Pledge of Allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I would like to call the administrative public hearing to order at this time. My name is Fred Chapman. I am a local government policy specialist for the Department of Community and Economic Development, and I am happy to serve as your hearing officer on this afternoon. This public hearing is being held in accordance with Act 47 as amended. The hearing today will be to present testimony relating to the recommendation for the rescission of the financial distress designation under provisions of Act 47, Municipalities Financial Recovery Act. Individuals representing the City of Scranton, City of Scranton's Act 47 coordinator, member of the Governor's Center for Local Government Services, and any interested party is invited to provide testimony after we provide our full testimony as the purpose of this rescission. Today's hearing is to be held to receive testimony related to whether the distress designation of the City of Scranton under Act 47, the Municipality's Financial Recovery Act should be rescinded. There is a sign-in sheet circulating to verify attendance of today's hearing. I will ask that all in attendance please sign the sheet. Even if you're not providing testimony, we ask that you please sign the sheet. Notice of today's public hearing has been published in accordance with the Sunshine Law and written notice have been provided to members of council, mayor, and the city of Scranton solicitor prior to this meeting. Now we would like the testimony to be presented at this time. I would ask the stenographer to please swear in those who wish to present testimony. If you change your mind at some point during this session, anyone in the audience, and you would like to provide testimony, that will be fine, but you will have to be sworn in before proceeding. Those who are sure they are providing testimony, if you could please stand at this time, and we will ask the stenographer to swear you in. Thank you. When you present your testimony, we ask that you step to the podium and please announce your name loud and clear so the stenographer can record. Okay, the first testimony we will have will be Mayor Paige Carnetti. Yes, please. All right, is this on? Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks for making the trip here. Um, 
I hope it stayed sunny and it's nice to see you in person instead of virtually like last time. My name is Paige Gebhardt Cognetti. I am the mayor of the city of Scranton. I appreciate um, very much uh, the support uh, and guidance um, from the Commonwealth, from the Department of Community Economic Development through the years, um, and especially our recovery coordinator, the Pennsylvania Economy League, uh, Jim and Jerry. We are deeply grateful for everything you've done for the city for, for all of these years. We last convened uh, in 2020 um, with the specter of economic catastrophe from the impact of the global pandemic. And while I, I just, you know, this week was reading through my testimony and, and, and our testimony, we, we met at a very, very scary time. And we're lucky that the worst case did not bear out and that uh, our revenues came in higher than we anticipated in those months. Um, and I appreciate last year the flexibility of DCED um, for listening to us and, and not having the, not, not having us exit during that uncertainty. It's been very, very helpful for us to see those revenues come in, get our, our feet under us, get through while we're still wearing these masks, get to a point where our economy is, is, is up and running. So since we did last convene, I wanted to mention a few highlights. Our revenues did come in higher than anticipated um, in, those, in those early months especially and throughout uh, 2020. So that was a huge help. The Act 511 litigation that was uh, before us again at the same time uh, 18 months ago when we last convened concluded in our favor. So that $50 million judgment um, is, is not on our shoulders and that was uh, still pending at that time. Our tax policy working group has continued to meet and try to take a whole picture of what is possible. Uh, that includes, of course, looking at a payroll preparation tax, which is you know, in the exit plan. Um, but I wanted to go year by year highlight. In 2021, um, the, with the help of city council and the prior administration, um, we put the refuse uh, fee onto the real estate tax bill. It has improved collections. I think that's a great example of collaboration. Um, all together and between administrations and between councils. This year we are hopeful. Um, there's a lot going on with the, the school district right now, um, but we are hopeful that we will pass a, a payroll preparation tax, not just in the city, but with the school district and be able to make that conversion next year, uh, which we think will improve our, our long-term revenue prospects in terms of a business tax. We're hoping that um, in, in 2022, we could petition for a hotel tax um, trying to be creative with revenue streams and see if there are ways that we can pull in. And we know it's not a massive amount of money, but we know that every bit helps. And we saw last year, with, you know, diversifying our, our portfolio of revenues, if you will, is going to be very important as we go into the future. Uh, we'll continue to push for a real estate property tax and uh, reassessment. Uh, a lot of us have been advocating that for that a long time. I think we've seen some movement and we're hopeful there. And what we're hoping is that if we can continue to manage things um, well and continue to get the, bring those revenues in, grow the tax base, that over time we, we might be able to reduce our wage tax little by little. We know that the wage tax is an impediment to our growth. Uh, we really hope that we can work together over the coming years to, to decrease that, you know, maybe just a tenth of a percentage point um, uh, every year if possible, and it's a big ask, but that's certainly a goal of ours um, as we look to, again, improve our economic growth prospects and take advantage of momentum we do have. Another highlight is that the S&P improved our rating from negative to stable, uh, which you know, I think everyone in this room knows that that's a, a big deal. It doesn't sound like much on its face, but that is a, a very good thing. Um, and our general obligation debt um, has a, a double B plus long-term rating. So while still just below investment grade, it's certainly an improvement. Um, so some highlights um, about the current condition of the city. Um, our current operational deficits have been eliminated and our financial condition has uh, improved. Um, that, Part of this uh, optimism is, lies in the, the payroll tax conversion and I think the, us taking a really good look at the tax makeup and that's working across our partners throughout the county, city, school district, our single tax office, and also working with the business community um, to, to manage through to these things. Uh, we also have looked at you know, how we collect our taxes are we have a new refuse, uh, delinquent refuse collector. We've, we're really looking at the collections as a piece too that hasn't been efficient in the past. And while it's not an overnight solution by any means, as you know, all of these contracts and agreements can take a while to change. Uh, we're taking a, a, 
a good look at that to be able to improve uh, in the future. Um, we've also We've also tried, and this, you know, by spurred by the pandemic, we've tried to cut to really cut out unnecessary spending and be um, more diligent in our monitoring. Um, as you all know, this is a city, not a business. We can't just decide not to sell a certain type of wi widget one year. Um, that does prohibit us from like making drastic cuts that we could, but we've tried to be as lean as possible uh, in the operational side, and uh, the same goes for how we're trying to manage the personnel side as well. <clears throat> on our debt, um, let's see, excuse me. So uh, obligations issued to finance uh, the city's debt have been retired, reduced, or reissued in a manner that has adequately, refi adequately refinanced outstanding principal and interest and has permitted timely debt service and reasonable probability of continued timely debt service. We've run, refunded all of the city's variable or high interest rate debt over the last few years, most recently the Emmaus refunding which was the last piece of high variable, variable debt on the city's books. Uh, we just called the Webster note, which brought our profile down to 77 plus million from over 100 million. The continual reduction of the tax, and tax anticipation note. Um, it was previously about 12.75 million. Last year, we brought it down to 12.2. Our current budget, uh, we have a $10 million TAN proposed. Um, we, think that's, we think that's progress. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing to um, you know, whittle that down if possible. I mentioned our credit rating, and then on the workers' compensation compensation front, labor and industry recognized our progress um, in managing claims and promoting safety, and released six million dollars from the reserve account. Um, we are working on the the uh, RFP for banking for an OPEB account so that we can begin. Uh, to that dedicated OPEB account. And I would mention that our, the way that we have been viewing um, requests for proposals in banking for the ARP money, for example, we're, we're doing proposals for all these banking services. We're, we're trying to be as transparent with contracting as we possibly can be. Uh, we are uh, the, very much have the highest bar um, in our region whether city or county for what you know some people look at us sometimes like how, how why did you have to do an rfp for that um we we always we always do that and um that's the the right thing to do scranton has negotiated or resolved all claims or judgments that would have placed the municipality in imminent jeopardy of financial um, distress the city has resolved several lawsuits um, i mentioned the act 511 litigation um, there's also, there was a suit challenging the city's receipt of proceeds from the sewer sale that was favorably resolved. And the city has resolved a number of um, federal suits as well. So we've taken uh, an aggressive tack on that in these two years to try to make sure that we don't have these hanging over our heads and of course um, do what we can to make sure we're not uh, setting ourselves up for future suits. The reasonably, pro reasonably projected revenues of the city are sufficient to fund ongoing necessary expenditures. Um, and let's see. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we will continue with dil diligent oversight of expenditures. Uh, regarding pension funding, levels have significantly improved, uh, making the MMO more affordable, um, and we have consistently paid the MMO um, by the due date. Um, we actually just signed today, I think, an adoption of the recently published mortality table for public sector employees, as suggested by the Society of Actuaries. There's a long, long way to go, as you all know, on, on these pension pieces. Um, and, and what we, what the actuary said is we could, you know, also reduce the, 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 product, the projected um, the, from 7.25 to 7 percent um, in terms of return. It was too far for us to go to both adopt the new mortality table and then reduce that return projection from seven and a quarter to seven. Um, but we'll, we'll do our best to reduce it to seven next year. So we're taking kind of a two-year approach on that, but just signed, signed our adoption of that new table next year. Hopefully we'll be able to reduce that, that down to seven. And lastly, we manage the 2020 budget um, to a surplus and projects the same for 2021. Our 2022 proposed budget does not include a tax increase 
Um, as you may know here in Scranton, we have a, a school district that is in recovery status from PDE, and they're, um, they have uh, kind of a mandate in place to tax, raise re real estate taxes quite significantly each year. So we are trying, and again, we appreciate Jerry and Jim for, for understanding the interplay between the two so well over time that we know that these are the same residents, and if, if they're going to be increasing real estate taxes by a significant amount, we, we want to be able to, to manage in these budget years to not necessarily do that ourselves. So <clears throat> the budget, um, it does include an increase uh, in administrative and collectively bargained positions in order to betty, better serve residents. Um, the costs of salary and benefits both for current employees and any new positions are real and they have to be managed over time. Um, in order to serve residents, we do need some more bandwidth. Um, but we also need to make sure we're paying for that. So I think we've seen we've um, been pursuing increased employee contributions into health care, and we will continue to look out phasing out uh, look at phasing out defined benefit plans in favor in favor of more sustainable defined contribution plans. I know that is not easily done, um, but I think over time there's just there's there's some really hard things that we'll have to do, and we're not afraid of of doing that hard work. <clears throat> And as we seek to exit in January, we're still working on a list of items to carry into 2022 and beyond. beyond. Those include financial policies for investment debt and fund balance. They're currently being reviewed um, by, some, <clears throat> by some folks that we've tapped for free consulting services to uh, help us make sure those are what we need. Opening the OPEB Trust, like I said, uh, seeking a HUP test either next year or the following year. Um, that's a pretty intensive thing, but it's really important that we, we do that, similar to a reassessment. We don't want to have entities that no longer qualify for tax exemptions getting those tax exemptions. So that is something that we very much want to do. We'll continue to ask for pilot contributions. Um, last year we got, I think, $63,000 more than, than the previous year, which again, these are small dollars, but the, the impact of sending those letters out and, and following up with those phone calls and having those conversations, I think that's something that can grow. Uh, we're going to be reestablishing um, an active redevelopment authority where there's actual funds and hopefully they'll be able to fund themselves over time so we can take advantage of economic growth and development. Um, we, we're also looking to establish a director of finance position to replace all of the work that Pell has conducted for the city for three decades. So while we're here today to advocate for the city of Scranton to be released from distressed status, um, and I believe the, the items that I just put forth show our readiness, I don't want to give the impression that we believe the future months, years, and decades are going to be easy. Like so many cities and other government entities, the city of Scranton has long-term debt obligations it will struggle to meet. We go into our days and our planning with eyes wide open to this. The way out is to manage austerity where possible and grow the city's revenue and tax bases. Growing the city is not possible without investing now at reasonable levels to spur economic growth. Our partnerships across the city region and nationally will help us as we navigate these waters in the coming years. We'll do our best to be successful and appreciate the past technical support and we hope future general support and guidance of the Commonwealth, DCED, and Pell. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for providing your testimony. We shall now hear testimony from Act 47 Coordinator, Mr. Jerry Cross, Pennsylvania Economy League. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. My name is Gerald Cross. I'm of the Pennsylvania Economy League, Central Pennsylvania Division. Our principal office is located in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. PEL is the DCED appointed Act 47 coordinator for the city of Scranton. I thank you for the opportunity to present our testimony today regarding our written Act 47 coordinator's recommendation to the Secretary of the Department of Community and Economic Development for the city of Scranton, which was dated October 20th, 2021. I request today that this recommendation to the secretary be included by reference to this testimony and made part of the official hearing record. As you are aware, Act 199 of 2014 amended Act 47 to provide a timeline and a process for municipalities to exit from the Act 47 program. For this city, the revised and updated Act 47 recovery plan 
was adopted by City Council on August 23, 2012. That started the Act 199 five-year timeline for the city to exit from the Act 47 program. As part of the Act 199 exit process, PEL as the coordinator was required to prepare and file a report stating the financial condition of the city. On February 17, 2017, we filed with the city a report stating the financial condition of the city of Scranton. Our findings in that report noted that although the city has made noteworthy progress on a number of fronts, a three-year exit plan was recommended for the city. PEL subsequently, in conjunction with city officials, prepared that three-year exit plan for the city. On July 27, 2012, the city adopted the Act 47 exit plan for the city. The three-year time limit for the city's adopted 2017 exit plan would have expired in July 2020. The coordinator provided testimony in support of such a rescission in March of 2020. However, on May 29, 2020, the governor of Pennsylvania signed into law an amendment to the fiscal code. Section 1604D.1 of that code provides for the following. A municipality operating pursuant to a recovery plan under the Act of July 10, 1987, known as the Municipalities Financial Recovery Act, shall be eligible for an 18-month extension beyond the time limit imposed under Section 254 of the Municipalities Financial Recovery Act. The coordinator, in consultation with the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, did prepare an amended Act 47 exit plan providing for this 18-month extension, which was adopted by the city in July 2020. The 18-month extension expires in January 2022. On October 20th, 2021, PEL, as the coordinator, submitted to DCD the recommendation to the secretary which included an evaluation of the Act 199 enumerated four factors for the Secretary of DCED to consider when making a determination on whether to rescind the distressed status of a municipality. The four factors are as follows. Number one, operational deficits of the municipality have been eliminated and the financial condition of the municipality as evidenced by audited financial statements prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles and projections of future revenues and expenditures demonstrates a reasonable probability of financial, future financial balance budgets absent participation in the Act. Factor two is obligations issued to finance the municipality's debt have been retired, reduced, or reissued in a manner that has adequately refinanced outstanding principal and interest and has permitted timely debt service and reasonable probability of continued timely debt service absent participation in the Act. Factor three is the municipality has negotiated and resolved all claims or judgments that would have placed the municipality in imminent jeopardy of financial default. Factor four is the reasonably projected revenues of the municipality are sufficient to fund ongoing necessary expenditures, including pension and debt obligations, and the continuation or negotiation of collective bargaining agreements and the provision of municipal services. Projections of revenue shall include any anticipated tax or fee increases to fund the ongoing expenditures for the first five years after termination of distress status. Our recommendation to the Secretary outlined the City's progress and circumstances under each of those statutory factors. For factor one, we found that the City has experienced a mix of operating budget surpluses and deficits over the past four years. For example, in 2018, the city had an audited 1.2 million or 1% operating deficit, but in 2020, the unaudited financial statement shows a surplus of 3.8 million or approximately 4%. Based on our review of the city's 2021 budget and operating positions through the first three quarters of this year, we estimate the city will have a slight 2021 surplus of approximately $800,000. Under factor two, we determined that the city efficiently utilized a significant portion of the $66.9 million from this, realized from the 2016 sewer sale proceeds, 
over the term of the 2017 exit plan to defease over $42 million in high yield, long-term general obligation notes and bonds. The city's total outstanding debt has decreased from 113 million in 2017 to under 80 million in 2021. More notably, since 2016, the city's overall debt has decreased by $78 million or 49%, which is a significant reduction. During the period 2016 to 2021, the city has made timely all of its debt service payments. It should also be noted that the city will retire its 2012 Act 47 loan of $1 million from the Commonwealth in the year 2022. For factor three, we found that during the amended exit plan period, the city has settled or fully adjudicated several outstanding lawsuits. However, we also noted that there remain several outstanding lawsuits that the city is defending against. One lawsuit in particular would retroactively reinstate the cost of living increases for retirees of the police department. This lawsuit involves a significant sum of money and does pose some potential future liability for the city. As coordinator, we concluded that the extent of any liability from this litigation is not possible to know until the litigation has been completed, which will most likely occur after the January 27, 2022 statutory deadline for terminating the city's distress status. Under factor four, the coordinator projects that the city will incur operating deficits throughout the 2022 to 2026 projection period on a baseline examination basis. The lack of inherent growth in the city's real property tax revenues and only slight growth in the city's earned income tax revenue when coupled with the annual projected expenditure growth of over 2% per year will cause the city to realize operating budget deficits throughout the projection period. However, offsetting these projected deficits, we believe, are the city's cash fund balance, as well as the 2021 American Rescue Plan intergovernmental transfer, which will replace lost revenue resulting from the 2021 COVID pandemic uh, restrictions. Therefore, for the city to mitigate the effects of its annual, the projected annual flat or de decreasing real property assessed valuations, the city will have to make in in incremental property tax rate increases and or reduce expenditures over the next five years to avoid the projected operating budget deficits. For the years 2022 to 2023, we believe the city will have sufficient ARP money available to cover the projected deficits. For 2023, the city can account for the small projected deficit of $129,000 through expenditure reductions or the use of its fund balance. However, as required by Act 199, the, co the coordinator must recommend that the city increase its property tax millage by varying percentages through the projection period. That is 5.1%, 14.8%, and 0.7%, or a variety or a mixture of those rates in the years 2024, 2026, to increase uh, municipal revenue, which will eliminate the projected operating deficits in those years. The total property tax percentage increase over the five-year period of 2022 to 2026 is 20.6% as recommended by the coordinator under Act 199. Any expenditure reductions implemented by the city during this period will reduce the recommended percentage property tax millage rates. Additionally, outside of the four factors, we examine the Act 199 requirement to determine whether the condition of a fiscal emergency is present in the city. A fiscal emergency exists if a distressed municipality is insolvent or is projected to be insolvent within 180 days or less, or is unable to ensure the continued provision of vital and necessary services, police, fire, refuse collection, or to meet payroll and debt service obligations. We have noted in our report that the city's adopted 2021 operating budget 
appropriated sufficient funds to provide many of the vital and necessary services, such as police and fire services, refuse collection and disposal, snow removal, payroll and pension obligations, and the required fulfillment of debt and other financial obligations. Our analysis also determined that the city was projected to be able to meet all of its financial obligations, including debt service and payroll. At the time of the writing of that recommendation to the secretary in October, there was no evidence from the city or otherwise that the city was insolvent or would be insolvent within 180 days or that the city would be unable to ensure the continued provision of vital and necessary services. Accordingly, it is the recommendation of the coordinator that based upon a review of the totality of the factors, substantial evidence supports a decision by the secretary of DCED to issue a determination rescinding the order declaring the city of Scranton a distressed municipality. Thank you for your time. Mr. Jerry Cross, thank you for your testimony. We will now hear testimony from Council Chairman Bill Gunn. Good afternoon. My name is Bill Gahan and I am the President of Scranton City Council. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to submit a statement regarding the recommendation of the City's Act 47 coordinator to rescind the City's distress determination pursuant to the Municipalities Financial Recovery Act, Act 47 of 1987, as amended. This is my eighth and final year serving on Scranton City Council. On January 10, 1992, when the city was declared financially distressed by a departmental order of the Secretary of the then Department of Community Affairs, I was four years old. For the majority of my life as a proud Scrantonian, the city has been deemed distressed. After many trials and tribulations over the last 29 years, I believe it is appropriate at this time for you to finally rescind the city's distress status for several reasons. First, the city has made tremendous progress over the last eight years in terms of our finances. In my first year as a city councilman back in 2014, the city's credit rating was terrible, it was almost non-existent. Financial institutions would barely give us the time of day, and city officials were constantly holding their breath at the end of the year to make sure we were able to meet our payroll. Today, the city is estimated to incur a surplus of nearly a million dollars at the end of this year. For the first time in recent memory, the city has a fund balance. This improvement in the overall financial condition of the city has come as a result of the hard work of the current and previous administrations and city council. I also would be remiss if I did not acknowledge former president of city council, Bob McGough, who I served with, who passed away from uh, his, a courageous battle with cancer. And he really started the ball rolling back in 2014 with some of the decisions that he made, and also the former business administrator, Dave Bolzoni, who I worked closely with as well. Many difficult and sometimes painful decisions had to be made in order to correct the fiscal mismanagement of the past. Since City Council adopted a three-year exit plan in 2017, all debt service payments have been made on time. The City's total outstanding debt decreased from about 113 million to $113.5 million to roughly $80.5 million today. Since 2016, the city's overall debt has decreased by nearly $80 million, or about 50 percent. This is tremendous progress for a city that only a few years ago was on the verge of bankruptcy. Secondly, the city has seen significant progress with regard to the solvency of its pension funds. In 2013, the market value of the city's aggregate pension fund was $43.7 million. In August of 2014, I listened to then Auditor General Eugene D. Pasquale forecast that within three to five years, our pension funds could run out of money, forcing us into bankruptcy. The city's financial stability looked bleak. Since that time, several difficult steps have been taken, and today the aggregate pension fund reached a market value of over $110 million dollars. The pension funds today are no longer on the verge of collapse, although they're still distressed. The future looks very promising. Third, 
Our Act 47 court recovery coordinator, the Pennsylvania Economy League, noted in their recommendation to you that one major issue in the city of Scranton is the lack of inherent growth in the city's real property tax revenue. According to their recommendation, in 20 years, the city's real property assessed value increased by only 2.7 percent, while the city's real property market value is increased by 81.1 percent. This is due in large part to the fact that reassessment has not been conducted in Lackawanna County since 1968. Thankfully, all indications are that a countywide reassessment will be conducted within the next few years, which will help reverse this troubling trend and improve the growth in the city's revenues from property taxes. Finally, after eight years on this council, I have never been more confident in the city of Scranton. Yes, we have challenges, just like every other municipality in Pennsylvania. But where there are challenges, there are also opportunities. We have proven that we can work together and make the difficult decisions necessary to keep our city financially stable and prosperous. Scranton's future looks extremely bright. Just yesterday, President Biden signed a $1 trillion infrastructure bill that will have an enormous impact on our city. As part of that historic legislation, $66 billion has been earmarked for the revitalization of passenger and freight rail, including a route between Scranton and New York City, which would potentially generate $87 million in annual economic activity. This city led the country in the development of the iron, rail, and coal industries in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Today, we are on the brink of charting a new course for the city of Scranton, where once again, we can be an important contributor to the success, not just of the Northeast, not just of the state of Pennsylvania, but of the United States of America. Today, I ask you to rescind this distressed status so that we can continue to capitalize on the progress made over the last eight years and make our city a place that our hardworking residents can be proud to live, work, and raise their families. Thank you. Thank you, Council Chairman, for providing your testimony. At this time, we will hear from the Department of Community and Economic Development Local Government Policy Specialist, Mr. James Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. I'm Jim Rose of the, I am the Local Government Policy Specialist for the Northeastern Region of DCED. I've been working for the city since I started working for DCED in 2013. At that time, finances were in terrible condition. We would have meetings, we would have regularly scheduled weekly meetings with the Economy League and the leaders of the city, and we would start to discuss how much money we had and would we be able to make payroll. This would start in the middle of the year as opposed to the end of the year. At that point in time, um, the uh, vendors were being unpaid for several months because the city just didn't have the mon money to pay them other than to pay their uh, payrolls. There was a great deal of animosity between city council and the mayor and um, certainly the unions. That kind of led to many, many problems because they weren't able to work on any of the the issues that were identified by the Economy League in the recovery plan and the city was not able to progress. I have to say, times have changed. During the course of the current administration and council and the previous two, all parties have worked together to move the city in the right direction and tackle the goals of the recovery plan. Visible animosity has not been seen for a long time. The results of these greatly improved relationships has enabled the city to develop reasonable and workable goals post Act 47. Scranton at this point, and I really can't believe I'm able to say this, but I can, Scranton at this point is financially stable. Should the elected officials continue to pursue the policies currently in place, I believe that the city is in a strong position to continue moving forward, and I strongly recommend that Scranton's status as a financially distressed municipality be terminated by Secretary Davin. Thank you. That ends my testimony. 
Thank you, Mr. Rose, for providing testimony. Are there any other interested parties at this time who would like to provide testimony? Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome to Scranton. Mr. Chapman, my name is Larry West. <clears throat> I'm the business administrator for the city of Scranton. I appreciate you affording me, affording me the opportunity to convey some thoughts regarding the city of Scranton and its long tenure under the Act 47 program. On January 10, 1992, the Department of Community Affairs, now the Department of Community Economic Development, then Secretary Karen A. Miller signed the order granting the petition that the city of Scranton be deemed a distressed municipality under the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's Financially Distressed Municipalities Act, Act 47 of 1987. In January of 1992, I was a young emergency medical technician providing pre-hospital care on the streets of Scranton. I could not have imagined that nearly 30 years later that I would be sitting here before you providing sworn testimony regarding the city's impending exit of that distressed municipality's designation. The statute by which, by which the distressed municipalities must adhere to is not foreign to me. Prior to my employment as the city's business administrator, I had the privilege to serve as regional director for former state senator John P. Blake, who represented the 22nd district and the city of Scranton in the Pennsylvania legislature from 2011 until April of 2021. Former Senator Blake served as minority chair of the Pennsylvania Senate's local government committee, as well as a member of the local government commission, chairing a subcommittee on taxation. The timing of my employment with the Senate allowed me a front row seat to what would become Act 199 of 2014 the Act 47 reform legislation, which in part is a reason for this hearing today. In 1992, the year the city was designated distressed, the operating budget was approved at $43.2 million. Ten years later, the 2002 operating budget saw a 34% spending increase to $58.2 million. The 2012 budget saw a 27.5% jump, lifting the spending plan to $85.3 million. In its third decade of distressed status, the city's proposed 2022 budget has been submitted at $116.9 million, which is, the second year, which is the second year in a row without a tax increase. The city has been, I'm sorry, the city has seen a 37% increase in spending over the last 10 years, which on average is a 33% 33, 33 increase in spending every 10 years. The Act 47 program allowed for a coordinator to assist the municipalities under distressed status. The Commonwealth appointed the Pennsylvania Economy League as Scranton's Act 47 coordinator. While under Act 47 designation, the city was required to adopt a recovery plan that would give the city leaders a blueprint for which they would develop strategies and help financially recover and eventually come out of distressed status. Over the course of 30 years, several administrators and councils with a consultation from Pennsylvania Economy League and other consultant, consultants adopted recovery plans, but for one reason or another found it difficult to follow through with implementation. With the adoption of Act 199 of 2014, municipalities were required for, the sun, for their sunset to, in the participation of the Act 47 program. Under the provision, the city of Scranton was supposed to exit in 2020, but due to COVID pandemic, we, requ we requested an extension from, from we requested an extension from DCED. After years of fledgling attempts to gain on its financial hardships, the city began gaining ground in 2016 with the sale of the sewer authority and the monetization of the parking system. Difficult decisions are, are commonplace in government and particularly in units of local government, but the city eventually committed it to its prior, to prioritizing its financial health and has been on a cleaner, a clearer and more sustainable path. With no solution, with, while no solutions are without uh, trade-offs, the city's pension levels have increased and we've been able to manage the budget to a surplus in 2020 and we project another in 2021. In my brief time as business administrator, the administration has made additional strides in financial stability. The city is enjoying an S&P rating upgrade to double B plus stable. It has paid off a $23 million loan early and for the second year in a row has reduced its requested amount of TRAN borrowing. The mayor and the administration have also been working on modernizing some tax policies, continuing to show fiscal restraint and working, toward implement, working to implement new policies regarding investments and fund balance all to ensure stabilizing the fiscal future of the city. 
Recognizing the continuing improvements that we have realized that have been realized by this city, it is my opinion to support the recommendation of Pennsylvania Economy League to rescind the distressed status designated for the city of Scranton and to exit Act 47 of 1987 at this time. Make no mistake, continued vigilance is, is a necessity and the fiscal health should remain the priority. I would be remiss if I didn't mention a couple of individuals for their contributions to the city's recovery. First, the Pennsylvania Economy League. Jerry Cross, their staff in particular. Jerry remained dedicated to supporting Scranton for over 20 years. His guidance, steady leadership, and knowledge of local government was essential to the eventual stability that we are enjoying today. And Dave Balzoni, the former business administrator for the city of Scranton, without doubt saved the city from, saved the city from financial ruin. His financial prowess, understanding of local government financing, and his ability to navigate the city's financial future during extremely difficult times proved his worth not once, but twice uh, in stints in the business administrator's office. And lastly, I would like to thank the residents, the landowners, taxpayers, city employees, and, business, and the business community for standing by their city. Without their patience, persistence, the city would not be where it is today, recovering. Thank you again for your time. Mr. West, thank you very much for providing testimony. Is there anyone else at this time? My name is Joan Hodewanitz, and I'm a resident of the city of Scranton. Um, I retired in 1998 and came back to the city of my birth. So I've been here approximately 22 years. And I've been watching um, the city's efforts to come out of distressed status for all those 22 years. I must compliment Mr. Cross on the leadership and guidance he's provided to the city in this effort. His assessments of uh, the financial status of the city and recommendations uh, for the city to take have been essentially right on target. Um, it would be nice if every citizen, especially the, those who pay property taxes, would sit down and read this 22-page document uh, that Mr. Cross wrote recommending we come out of distress status. And I, I'm very happy to see that happen. Uh, but that's not going to be realistic. They're not going to read it. So a lot's going to depend on the way this gets reported in the press. And many people are going to feel, I think, a false sense of security that we're coming out of distress status and all of our problems are behind us. This could happen again if we lose track of what we're doing. Citizens are responsible for the oversight of their elected officials, whether it's through reading the newspaper, listening to the radio, listening to t TV news, however they want to do it. You may not know this if you are not a city resident, but Scranton has a long legacy of corruption. Uh, one of our prior mayors is currently in prison. Um, and a lot, I think a lot of that uh, history of corruption has created a, a lack of confidence in the integrity of the city. Fortunately, Mayor Evans and Mayor Cognetti, our current mayor and our future mayor, have done an amazing job to restore that confidence in, in our government officials. But um, we need to maintain oversight of the way we spend our tax dollars from the citizens, the city controller's office, our independent auditor, and even the state auditor general. This could happen to us again. How many citizens are going to be told or even realize that there's a potential for major real estate millage increases in their tax bills? Right now, 
They're trying to cope with inflation. Somebody tell them that there could be, over the next five years, a 20.6% increase in their property taxes. And that's not going to go down well. That's why I'm saying that it becomes important while we should celebrate the fact that we're coming out of distressed status, we should also be realistic in, in explaining to the citizens of the city and the taxpayers uh, the status of finances as we project them for the next five years. Mr. Cross is right. There's two plus percent increase every year in expenditures. The only way to have a balanced budget is to increase revenues by the same amount or to find ways to cut those expenditures. I don't think that's going to happen. I think you're going to need to find tax revenue. Otherwise, you're going to be looking at double-digit property tax increases. And we've been through that before. So while I want to thank um, Mayor Cognetti and her staff, and the prior staff, especially Mr. Boldzoni, I want to thank Mr. Cross for his leadership and guidance of the city to get us out of this 29-year nightmare. I want people to sit back and think, why did this happen? How did this happen? How do we make sure it doesn't happen again? Because this city cannot afford another financial disaster. The Titanic has got to make it into the port of New York. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for your testimony. Are there any other testimonies at this time? I would like to thank those in attendance and those who provided testimony at today's administrative public hearing. The Department of Community and Economic Development will respond to your request for a rescission. And we will proceed with the Act 47 exit process. All findings will be presented to Secretary Dennis Davin for his consideration and official determination of rescission. Thank you once again, and I will now close this Act 47 administrative hearing.